and welcome to the video on kurtosis. Now, I can legitimately say with this video that there's some degree of controversy about this statistical measure. As recently as 2014, the world of kurtosis was uh, turned on its head a little bit. So this topic is maybe a little bit more in flux than a few of the others. All of which you can find up on zstatistics.com. So, here we go. I'm going to give you the def definition of kurtosis as it was historically given. And then we'll have a look at how it's calculated and also how then to describe various distributions in terms of its kurtosis. And finally, we'll look at that controversy. Controversy? Controversy? However you say it, uh, we'll look and see how the historical definition is now changing. So stick around, this should be quite interesting. Now... Traditionally, and in textbooks, kurtosis was defined as the peakedness of a distribution. So let's explore what that might have meant. So here is our, here is our sort of uh, a bell curve type distribution. Doesn't need to be a normal distribution, but whatever. It's nice and symmetric at least, right? Now let's just say it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of five. So that standard deviation defines the spread of this distribution. Now, what we can do is we can play around with the two shoulder areas. So, this sort of these highlighted regions here, I'm going to call the shoulder regions. And if we kind of extract some of the data in these regions and deposit it both at the top and in the tails in both of these two sides, what we can do is we can actually create a new distribution that has the same value for its mean and standard deviation but looks a little bit different. So here's a new distribution that you can see we've kind of taken some of some of that density from its shoulder area and we've deposited it in the central region. So the frequency of these values near the mean increase, but also the frequencies at the tails increase as well. You can kind of see the black line ending up on top of the white line as it trails off to infinity, right? So the whole point of kurtosis is to find a way for us to differentiate between these two distributions. Because as I said, they can both have the same mean and standard deviation, yet look quite different in shape, right? And they also both have zero skew as well, so that's not going to help us define the difference here. So in comes kurtosis. And we might say then that the black curve is more peaked and has fatter tails than the white curve. And we would then say that the black curve has a higher kurtosis. Now you'll notice that we say it's both more peaked and has fatter tails, but part of the controversy that we'll deal with is actually that the peakedness doesn't really affect the kurtosis. It's all about the tails, but all in good time, we'll get there by the end of the video. Let's first have a look at how we calculate the kurtosis. Now, in my last video on skewness, I tried my hand at explaining some of these moments. And we got to the point where we were looking at the first three moments. And we could look at the third moment where we standardized it by dividing by sigma cubed. And we found that that was the skew. Now, it should be unsurprising to you that we can get to the fourth standardized moment, which will look very similar to the skew, except that things are raised to the power of four. Now, this is going to form our kurtosis, obviously, but you'll notice that in these three examples I've given you for variance, skew, and now this proto-kurtosis equation here, I've actually got the population values mu and sigma in these equations. So we need to get rid of those because in reality, you're only ever going to have a sample. So we need to adjust for things like the degrees of freedom and you can see in the variance equation now, because we have x bar on top, that's our sample mean, we need to make the number of degrees of freedom n minus 1. We learnt that in the variance video. Now, it looks a bit grosser in the skew formula, right? We have x bar and we also have s estimating sigma in this equation. So we had to adjust for that, for our, the fact that we're using a sample as opposed to the population. And the adjustment was a little bit more confusing. We had n over n minus 1 times 
n minus 2. But that is the equation that will provide you an estimate of the skew from your sample. Now guess what's going to happen here? We've got mu and sigma and we want to change that into x bar and s. Well, no surprise, it's going to get ugly, peeps. Are you ready for this? Here it is. We've got <laughs> x bar and s. So this is that central bit from the previous equation and all the other junk either side, all the n's and the n minus 1 squared and everything here is just to adjust for the fact that we have this, we're using x bar and s as estimates for mu and sigma. You can consider this being just some hectic sampling adjustment, which is the formula for kurtosis, or at least it's the one that they use in Excel and a variety um, of other statistical packages use this one as well. So look, don't ask me to help you out in figuring out why there's so many bloody end terms on, a, on each side. Um, the, re the reason why it's so complicated is that when you have got this sort of estimating situation happening and it's being raised to the power of four, things get a little bit complicated in terms of the degrees of freedom that you're losing in taking the sample, right? So if you just sort of accept that it's gross in terms of all these ends, hopefully you can still see that the core of this equation is this sort of fourth moment where you've got the difference from the mean to the power of four all divided by the standard deviation to the power of four. And it's this central bit of the equation that we're going to return to when we look at the controversy. And hey, if you're interested in learning a bit more about degrees of freedom generally, I'll put up a little link to my video, my extensive video on degrees of freedom right here. But let's continue. So this is going to be a little bit gentler when we're describing kurtosis. So a normal distribution, that's a bell curve shape, has a kurtosis of three. So it's exactly three. And it's just, again, a part of the very nice properties of a normal distribution that things like this just drop out. The kurtosis of three is then called mesokurtic. So any distribution that has a kurtosis of three is called mesokurtic. Distributions of a kurtosis greater than three are called leptokurtic. So we saw that at the beginning. If you have a more pronounced kind of central region and longer tails, you might say it's leptokurtic. And distributions with a kurtosis less than three and here I've actually got a uniform distribution, but we'll call that platykurtic. And it'd be less than three if you have broader shoulders, if you like, but a flatter central bit and shorter tails. A more stocky distribution, one might say. Okay, so what are the range of values that kurtosis can take? We know that a normal distribution has a kurtosis of three, but how low or high can kurtosis get? Well, kurtosis ranges from 1 to infinity, where the normal distribution sits at 3. So 1 is this sort of lowest level of kurtosis one can get from any distribution. Whereas on the positive side, it can go all the way to infinity. Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing. Sometimes you'll see kurtosis referred to as excess kurtosis, which is basically the original kurtosis calculation minus 3. And the reason why we've got this excess kurtosis format is that I guess it puts the normal distribution at zero, right? So anything with a negative kurtosis, that implies it has a lower kurtosis than a normal distribution. And anything with positive means it's got a higher kurtosis than a normal distribution. So excess kurtosis would range from minus two to infinity. And just be careful which one that your source refers to, because sometimes they'll even refer to this excess kurtosis as just kurtosis. So it does get a bit confusing, but it should be clear. Well, most reputable sources will tell you whether it's referring to the unadjusted or original kurtosis versus what we consider to be excess kurtosis. All right, now, this is the fun bit. Here's the issue. Kaplansky in 1945 basically figured out that there were certain anomalies to the whole idea that higher peaks would necessarily equal fatter tails. 
there were some distributions where you could get a flatness in that central region and also fatter tails for the same standard deviation. So you could hold everything else constant and you could get flatter peaks and fatter tails. So there's something not quite watertight about the whole connection with peakedness. So here's the paper, A Common Error Concerning Kurtosis by Irving Kaplansky from Columbia University. So in the hope of clearing up this error, we offer in this note four examples showing that any combination of peakedness at the mean and kurtosis may occur. But despite this happening in 1945, the connection between kurtosis and peakedness continued in textbooks, in academic papers, much to the frustration of uh, someone from Texas Tech Uni, Peter Westfall, who's kind of been on a crusade to correct the persisting analogy to peakedness. So he actually wrote a paper some years ago called Kurtosis as Peakedness, 1905 to 2014 RIP, where he basically is pointing out that the peakedness doesn't matter. It's all about the tails. You could have as much peakedness as you like, but as if the tails aren't playing ball, then it's not affecting your kurtosis. So let's have a little bit more of a closer look at his idea. So here is that distribution again, just a plain old bell curve. The fourth standardized moment, remember I gave you this bit here. Let's ignore all those sampling adjustments, right? That'll just confuse matters for no good reason. But what I want to show you is that this denominator, which is sigma to the power of four, that's just the variance squared. Okay, right? So that's sigma squared squared. And you might be thinking, okay, great. That doesn't help me out, Justin. But have a look at the formula here. It's the sum of x minus mu squared on n, because that's the formula for the variance, all squared. So it's actually a very simple thing that Peter Westfall is trying to say. What he's suggesting is that if you look at the numerator, outliers contribute greatly to that summation. If you have an observation that's very, very far away from mu, which is the mean, right? All of a sudden that distance is getting raised to the power of four. So it's really cranking up the effect of that single observation if it's a huge distance from the mean. And while the mathematics might not be super straightforward, the denominator doesn't compensate fully for that massive increase that you get on the numerator. So it's really with the outliers that the kurtosis is getting formed. Observations near the mean, think about them. If you're very close to the mean, by raising it to the fourth power, you're actually not getting a particularly large value, respectively, right? And in fact, if it's within one unit of the mean, by raising it to the fourth power, you're actually reducing the size of it, right? If it's 0.5, raise 0.5 to the power of four. See what you get. So observations, you can have as many observations near the mean that you like, but it's not really affecting this calculation of kurtosis as much as those few observations in the tails do. Now I've glossed over a lot of mathematics that would show that that's the case, but you can kind of see it in this formula, can't you? That power of four is so strong on the top there that you're not going to escape that conclusion. So I guess what's happening now is that we no longer refer to the peakedness necessarily when we're talking about kurtosis, but we refer more to the idea of the thickness of the tails or alternatively, the presence of outliers and how far away the outliers tend to be. So it's still going to be true that distributions with a high kurtosis will likely have a higher peak as well but that doesn't necessarily flow through from the calculation of kurtosis itself. It's more to do with just the way distributions commonly work. Interesting, no? So that is kurtosis. We still have that calculation for it, and you can find it in your default packages, your default statistical packages, and it does tell us something about the distribution, but the idea that it's telling us about the peakedness in itself is not necessarily true. 
All right, so there you go. That is kurtosis. And that kind of finishes up the, the sort of routine measures that you get for descriptive statistics in most statistical packages. I've got a few more videos in this series where we look at moments and the standard error of the sample mean and also some boutique measures of both central tendency and spread just to kind of round things off. But if you like what I do, subscribe to the channel and you can check out the remaining videos on zstatistics.com. Thanks for watching.